Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the second episode of the First Watch Podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining. Over this past 4th of July weekend, I decided to revisit two American classics. Well, depending on your perspective, technically I watched four, including George Lucas's finest cut of California nostalgia, American Graffiti, and debatably the only watchable Roland Emmerich film, Independence Day. <laughs> To tell you the truth, my dirty secret, I actually kind of think that Emmerich's woefully misnamed Godzilla is better than some people think. And ultimately, if it had just been called something like Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, almost no one would really have a problem with what a stupid, fun monster movie it is. But I digress. The two classics that I was referring to are Magic Mike and its 2015 sequel, Magic Mike XXL. So I'll save any and all takes for the big lizard for a potential future pod, and uh, today we'll, we'll, we'll keep to the subject matter at hand. Both Magic Mike films center around their titular stripper, Mike Lane, and his cohorts, a group of hunky male entertainers. Together, they add up to just under four hours of muscle-bound, gyrating bro time that, regrettably, are actually a bit underrated in my opinion. I was curious and more than a little disappointed to see that in spite of warm critical reception for both films, the two have fairly middling user scores on Letterboxd, Rotten Tomatoes, and IMDb. I was also a bit surprised by how much each movie seemed to split viewers' opinions, with many people that I saw having a strong preference for the original or for the sequel. I'm a big fan of both, and so I wanted to take some time and unpack what I think makes each installment special, as well as discuss the interesting and satisfying ways that the two films compare and contrast to one another. With that said, I will be covering both Magic Mike films on this episode, so if you've not seen one or both films, I would highly recommend that you go and do that. Not only do I think that each movie is well worth your time, but it will assuredly make this podcast a bit easier to follow. So for those looking to avoid spoilers, go check out two of the best dudes rock flicks you'll ever see in your life, and for everyone else, let's dive on in, starting with the original. Magic Mike is a 2012 film directed by one of my personal favorites, Steven Soderbergh, who had an almost comically prolific decade, particularly considering that he announced his retirement from directing in 2013 before releasing two separate television series and four more films to add to the seven 2010s movies he'd already released prior to that point. Of all that work, much of which is awesome, Magic Mike is my personal favorite of the bunch. And Soderbergh's productivity actually is something that's echoed in Mike's, a man who works multiple gigs in addition to stripping, which is at the film center. See, the secret about Magic Mike, as anyone who's seen it knows, is that while it certainly has a lot of super hot, half-naked male entertainers, it's not really about the profession so much as it's about the idea of working in the gig economy. If it's right alongside Loreen Scafaria's 2019 film Hustlers, as two effervescent movies that use stripping as a launchpad for discussing socioeconomic issues and their consequences. We all signed up for Beefcake, and we got served a lesson about the inherent difficulty of class mobility. Thank you, Comrade Soderbergh. The narrative of this film, and again, I'll pause to say, spoilers approaching, largely consists of Mike hiring, unbeknownst to him, his own replacement. The ostensible deuteragonist of Magic Mike is a character called Adam, played by British actor Alex Pettifer, who at the time was coming off back-to-back-to-back semi-hits, I Am Number 4, Beastly, and In Time, and he seemed destined for big things, at least from a commercial perspective. In retrospect, it's weird, and maybe kind of a blessing, that this kid didn't end up with some comic book IP that would have shoved him in our faces for years to come. Magic Mike was really the last big film Pettifer was a part of, but his contemporaneous position reflects Adam's own as the young up-and-comer who, as a foil to Mike, is rudderless and lacking both a profession and a driving ambition, at least at the film's start. We see each of these two men rub up against a rude boss at their roofing gig where the two are introduced to one another. Each one is feeling the press of the workplace and responding to it in vastly different ways. Mike doubles down, taking on multiple jobs, negotiating for higher pay, a percentage of the strip club, and saving up all his cash to eventually start a small business. And Adam is... getting his nick done on, crashing on his sister's couch, quitting the jobs that come his way, and playing video games. Eventually, Mike takes the notably underage Adam under his wing and thrusts him crotch-first into the late-night world of male entertainment, where we're introduced to the rest of the cast, most notably Matthew McConaughey as the owner and MC Dallas. And we're also introduced to a crew of dancers that make up the staff of Exquisite, the nightclub in question. In direct contrast to the sequel Magic Mike XXL, which I'll delve into in a bit, 
the original film somewhat eschews its stable of characters and the finer points of stripping as a job. The stripper action, though plentiful, is really just a backdrop for Mike, an aging dancer looking for equity, and Adam, whose listless life path is suddenly given direction by being brought into this world. It's an interesting contrast between the two characters, and one which clearly demonstrates how gigs of all sorts draw in young people with a paycheck, relationships, structure, and the occasional bisexual threesome, but ultimately provide them little in the way of future stability along the way. Mike has to claw for his cut. No matter how valuable he's been, he's only getting older, and there's always a young man ready and willing to take his pants off and a lower percentage stake. Now, some people have criticized the subtextual meat of this film as being a bit basic or overwrought, and I personally don't agree with that. I think it perfectly captures the unforgiving churn of the hourly laborer. In 2012, when this film was first released and I saw it in theaters, I was working a full-time job, a part-time job, and going to college. And of those three, the lattermost, the only one that, at least in theory, set me up for future success, felt like the biggest hindrance. If I could just drop art history, I could get more overtime or earn more tips. See, the gig economy forces many people into a tough spot where they have to try and balance the present and the future, and Soderbergh plays with that exact tension masterfully, and years before many major films were even discussing things like this. The line that you can draw from Magic Mike to Hustlers also extends from this film to the rest of the 2019 stable of Eat the Rich films, and at least in my opinion, this movie actually gets that material more right than most. All of this subtext is massively elevated by McConaughey's performance as Dallas. He manages to portray the character in a way that's deeply recognizable to me. He's a manager we've all had that you admire and disgust in equal measure. He's a manager we've all had who you admire and disgust in equal measure. He builds you up and leads you on and breaks you down and pulls the rug from under you just to turn on the charm and build you all the way back up again tension and the eternal spin cycle of working for a wage while someone else gets a bigger cut off your labor. Ultimately, the two leads' roles are opposed, with Mike abandoning ship and Adam being pulled directly into the center of the storm. It's a story that works very well, although I also think Soderbergh slips up just a little bit in his depiction of the job itself. He does smartly focus in on the economic realities of contemporary U.S. capitalism, and he taps deeply and effectively into the anxiety of this setup, especially for Mike, while contrasting it with Adam's naivete. Yet, for all its sharpness, I also think it feels a bit misguided in its judgment of strippers. The film, to its credit, has nothing but empathy for its performers, who all seem like genuinely nice guys, save perhaps Dallas, who still is not exactly monstrous in my opinion, but it seems to take a dim view of the hard partying nightlife, drug use, and the like. And this quality is only amplified by how much it sidelines the other dancers, failing to give them any sort of depth in favor of really hammering its themes. Another point of contention for me is the film's other most important character, Brooke, Adam's sister and Mike's burgeoning love interest, who seems to sincerely detest the stripping scene. She's naturally concerned for her, again, underage, younger brother, and admonishes some of Mike and the boys' bad habits. And while that's not a bad or foolish attitude for her character to have, the film very much paints her as a sort of voice of reason who ultimately talks some sense into Mike without ever really taking a critical view on her one-sided perspective. See, it's ultimately satisfying to see Mike leave the business, to take a chance on himself and his dreams. His decision is one that mirrors Soderbergh's 2010's trajectory towards the indie scene, where he began making films on iPhones, dropping them on Netflix, taking ownership of his own creation, and the distribution of his work. But the finish of the film feels muddied by the idea that Mike is not just escaping a toxic system or a bad boss, but also a harmful environment overall, which I find to be a little silly. Brooke, for all her posturing, and for all the ways the film proves her concerns to be right, has almost certainly had a drink and a blunt after a bad day at the office, and stripping, as the movie keenly demonstrates with the roofing gig at the open of the film, is hardly the only job where laborers get an unfair shake. So it's a little challenging to take as much joy as we should in Mike's growth, because I want to celebrate his new path toward ownership and stability, whereas Brooke and arguably the film seem to be happy he's no longer going to be amongst the vampires, in her own words. None of those qualms really keep me from enjoying or even loving this film, but along with eschewing some of its players' characterization, and boy are we about to go deep on some of these characters, this somewhat muddy conclusion does register as a fault for me that otherwise clouds a really brilliant workplace film. 
Magic Mike XXL, in stark contrast to its predecessor, isn't the least bit concerned with leaning into the economic subtext of the original, and that threw me when it debuted in 2015. XXL drops off the original director and his clear interest in digging into the workplace themes in favor of Soderbergh's longtime assistant director, Gregory Jacobs, an arousing bit of guys being dudes. The sequel retains screenwriter Reed Carolyn and director of photography Steven Soderbergh, so it's still plenty sharp when it does tap into the first film's themes, as when the characters are discussing their future careers, and it also retains a look and feel that complements the original. Magic Mike XXL tells the classic story of the last hurrah. At the end of the first film, Mike leaves the biz as the boys take their show from Tampa to Miami in search of greener pastures and green dollar bills. In the intervening three years, Mike has started the business he aspired to, and Dallas and Adam abandon the club to travel to Europe. It's a bold choice to drop off McConaughey, both the best and most famous actor in the original film, but Pettifer is largely unmissed. Though Adam is an important functional part of the first film, that performance is neither special nor particularly focused on. By ditching these two, as well as Brooke, XXL chooses to do exactly what Magic Mike disappointingly did not. It makes the film exclusively about the dancers. Mike, Richie, portrayed by Joe Manganiello, Ken, played by Matt Bomer, Tito, played by Adam Rodriguez, and Tarzan, played by wrestler Kevin Nash. Both Bomer and Rodriguez got their starts in television, Rodriguez famously on CSI Miami, and Bomer, who you might recognize from USA's White Collar. Manganiello, on the other hand, is a person that actually kind of got a big break after the Magic Mike films and has been fairly prolific in the back half of the last decade, but the roles that I most remember him for are in Critical Role, Word to My D&D Nerds, and as Flash Thompson in the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Now that Dallas is out of the picture, and Exquisite is no more, the Kings of Tampa are headed back to Miami to their home turf on the way to a stripper convention in Myrtle Beach. Along the way, they pick up Mike, and the story morphs into a road film toward a big blowout farewell to the biz and for the crew. The film proceeds to lean near totally into this ensemble. Each character, no matter how minor they felt in the previous film, is now explored in great depth. They all have multifaceted personalities, insecurities, ambitions, goals, dreams. And that's a very savvy choice to make in a sequel. It's a broader story that trades in thematic focus for having a good old time and really getting to know these men along the way. Much of the narrative centers around the former exquisite employees reconciling with Mike, who walked out on them three years prior, and this gives the movie an opportunity to flesh each character out. It begins to peel back what I think makes XXL such an excellent sequel in general. Here I should mention, while I do think both of these movies are great, as I said before, I do actually prefer the sequel. This is a big departure from my first impression back in 2015, which was that it was a fun time, but not as smart as its predecessor was, by virtue of dropping off that film's themes. What I've come around on, however, is not only the deeper characterization and better and more joyful chemistry, which is a huge plus, but also the way the characters lead into the film's thesis. Reinvention. If we zoom out a bit, consider the task of following up Magic Mike with a new film, and what the best way to do that is. And the choice that XXL makes almost requires a bit of a retcon. To deepen these characters, it almost has to inject something where before there really wasn't much depth. It smartly builds off the actor's performances and personalities. The pretty boy Ken, for example, is now revealed to be a sensitive soul and an aspiring musical artist. It's not a huge leap, which helps. But what really makes the transition work is the way the story itself mirrors this creative choice. Characterizing XXL as a road film with a singular physical destination might lead one to think it exists on a wire, like a greased up shirtless version of Martin Scorsese's After Hours or something, but the film is actually rather content to play the trip as a series of vignettes. As I mentioned before, a lot of the movie consists of the other performers confronting Mike's sudden departure in their own way. There's also some contrived mishaps, of course, which give the movie a chance to play with the toys in its toy box, both metaphorically and literally. One of the most important scenes in the film happens pretty early on when Richie begins to cover the routines for the team's new show once they get to Myrtle Beach. His plan is to play the hits. In the original film, which takes place in a strip club, the dances are pretty much what you'd expect of the profession. Manganiello is wearing a fireman's outfit, Tatum's in a sailor's hat, all the boys get gussied up in front of the American flag on the 4th of July. But Mike presents a bold idea to the crew on their way to the beach. What if, instead of playing with the classic tropes, 
the ones that Dallas and metatextually Steven Soderbergh himself foisted upon them and did something different. As Mike points out, Rishi never wanted to be a firefighter. In fact, he has a fire phobia and he doesn't really care for the song that he dances to. He does his performance because it works, but Mike probes, what if they could do something more? At the time, all the boys are rolling on Molly. I told you, this film is joyful fun. And they almost all really embrace the idea of doing something new, even as it intimidates them. And what follows is one of the best scenes in the film, where Richie's confidence stumbles now that he's thrown his fireman uniform literally out the window. And the boys challenge him to give an impromptu dance to a gas station clerk to get his groove back, which he does spectacularly spectacularly, with a bag of Cheetos and a bottle of water as the gang cheers him on through a window. The film finds plenty more excuses to get these and other men undressed and dancing, along the way picking up some new characters played by Jada Pinkett Smith, Donald Glover, and former New York Giants defensive end Michael Strahan stripping. This movie rocks. <laughs> and it really gives the ensemble a chance to shine. What's so cool about both of these movies, but particularly XXL, is we get to see what non-toxic male friendship looks like. This is a group of men who spends their time almost exclusively around women and one another. They're not as bound up by possessiveness, jealousy, or competitiveness. In fact, the ultimate goal of this film, the convention, is directly said not to be a competition. This is a movie about wholesome friends being wholesome, supporting each other, and making the most of their time together. By the film's end, the big blowout event, the purpose of all of this becomes clear. Where the original film left the characters of this ensemble somewhat flat and used the dancing as a backdrop, now the performances and the performers take center stage and fuse into one glorious whole. Each dancer has a new routine which reflects their personality. Tarzan does a painting routine. Ken croons his heart out. Tito sprays some very suggestive whipped cream in his candy shop. Mike and a new friend give a dance performance that left my jaw on the floor. And my personal favorite, Richie's two-part act with a wholesome Bruno Mars Marry You needle drop that segues seamlessly into a BDSM heavy number set to Nine Inch Nails Closer. David Fincher, eat your heart out. Just as this film reinvents its characters, they reinvent the performances to be an extension of who they are and their aspirations. It's such a stunning and beautiful place to take a story whose only real requirement was to be hot, and the result is that we get an overwhelming amount of sex appeal, an excellent dose of character, and a really rousing piece on being yourself and the friends who help you figure out just what that means and how extremely important it is. I adore this movie, and I'm so happy it exists. I'm happy both of these films exist, and I look forward to my next watches of each. If you've seen Magic Mike and Magic Mike XXL, what did you think of them? Do you have a preferred entry? Leave any feedback you have in the comments, and if you liked the episode, please feel free to like and share. I hope to talk with you all again soon.